Foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, good morning. This is Ardy. Good morning. This is Grace. And of course, you are with us another week where we discuss about news in Southeast Asia. But first of all, we would like to share with you some news uh, from the U.S. As we all know, Hillary Clinton has announced her 2016. Presidential bid. I'm so happy for her. Well, is it, it? I think it is for the second time, right? That she wanted to uh, go for the presidential yes, election. Yes, the second time. The mm-hmm. first time, of course, she lose up to Obama, and she ended up as the state secretary for Obama, and she did a terrific job. And and uh, in the beginning, after uh, she ended her term as the uh, state of se- state of secretary for the U.S., she initially said that. She She do not want to contest as the president, mm-hmm. but uh, for now that she actually announces it, I, I I'm actually quite excited. I've been a huge fan of Hillary Clinton for so long. And then there will be um, a female president if uh, she really gets the elections uh, in the 2016. Mm. And in fact, uh, it looks more like she's more prepared than ever before to, to run the uh, president, uh, uh, running for the president. At the same time, um, this announcement came in uh, like you know, minutes after the email uh, from John uh, Podesta and uh, Mr. Clinton's campaign chair alerting the donors and a long time Clinton's also said to her candidacy so mm-hmm. it's something that um, it is a pretty uh, hot news in America at the moment it is and in fact this is what she said in a, in a two minute video release just after three o'clock in, uh, in the evening she said that I'm running for for president and she smiled and she said that everyday Americans need a champion and I want to be the champion so I'm hitting the road to earn your vote because it's your time and I hope you will join me on this journey I'm actually really excited on uh, for her not just on uh, you know it's US politics and because she's a woman it, because also on a personal level I think she's one of the smartest person not woman but person in general that I I ever met I still remember in 2010 when she was the state secretary she went to Malaysia this was mm-hmm. one of her trip and and I, I was a really young <laughs> A girl at that time, and I, I got the opportunity to actually uh, be in the town hall meeting where she hosted, uh, at the U.S. Embassy Kuala Lumpur hosted, and I got the opportunity to ask her a few questions, and I can tell you that she is smarter than her husband. <laughs> actually, uh, as much as uh, she, uh, she, she is very um, ambitious and a very smart lady, she also inspires a lot of people, um, not only in America but. Also Outside of the that uh, state, and also she has her own lot of methods and approaches that how women can become, you know, such uh, be in the, such a position. Mm-hmm. Even in policy wise, a lot of people might not know, but she has been working on issues related to education, women, girls for so long, and. In terms of her um, her role in education, a lot of people might not know as well. During the 90s, when her husband, uh, uh, former pr- uh, President Bill Clinton, was in power, mm-hmm. she actually uh, wanted to push for a universal healthcare policy. Although it failed, but uh, to me personally, on a personal level, as she, at that time she was the first lady for United the United States, I thought it was a very courageous attempt for her to do that. I mean. Uh, I don't. I cannot imagine any first lady of any country would go to sh- to such extent, you know, to push for a policy mm. for for free healthcare. 
And then at the same time, well, you mentioned that it were it failed, the campaign failed. However, to have to start with the the, the campaign for the nation, it is actually a something coming from the female, mm -hmm. and also uh, she had a lot of a uh, counter sort of uh, feedback from the oppositions and uh, many others. But then, no matter, regardless of that, she still has uh, her passion and then also the goal to achieve what she wants to achieve for the nation. Mm -hmm. Personally, for South Koreans, what do they think of? Uh, Hillary Clinton. Well, uh, we have the female president uh, president in so our So you're like, we are first. <laughs> Not that we are first. It's just that because we have the female president in our nation, we also look forward to seeing another female president in another the country. And then, in fact, America is a gigantic country. So uh, it will definitely bring uh, different perspectives and then influences to the nation. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward on her policy towards Asia. If she will ever be debating it uh, during her presidential campaigns. Uh, I think Asia is one of the key uh, foreign policy of the US in the coming years. Uh, in the past, it used to be just the Middle East or Europe. But I think Asia has become a significant economic and also political strength for the US to conquer. And of course, uh, the Asia would include Southeast Asia as well. Of course. And on another news, uh, besides uh, the US, we have China. But this is not about China's foreign policy. It's about China's health policy. So campus condom machines plan for Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh, Grace. Why are you laughing at? Well, because it's a Monday morning. <laughs> and then the second news we're dealing with is something to do with the condom vending machines in China. <laughs> Well, uh, I as much as it sounds very quirky, um, uh, they have actually have these machines in Beijing this year to reduce the risk of infection among the students, especially. And then uh, it was already reported that they have the communicated with the uh, the Education Commission, and it is very uh, certain that they can reach all these consensus on the issues there ha that have been happening in China. It's funny that only now, like. China is addressing issues like HIV or AIDS. I wonder what happened in the past. Like they would just, would they just like close one eye? You know, whatever health, sexual, um, reproductive issues happened. I guess uh, they had the policies, for example, like one child policies already that was implemented a long time ago. But then it may have looked like it doesn't apply to students. Like, you know, mm -hmm. students being going perhaps wild or <laughs> they were just going <laughs> against the policies, you see. So perhaps having the vending machine <laughs> in the university probably can help and also bring the awareness of the, you know, uh, after effects, you know, it could uh, actually lead to a HIV and other, you know, all the sexual diseases they can, you know, they can have in the future. I, I'm just curious because in the past, where do they actually get the condoms or they don't use it at all? I don't know, Ali, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure like all those uh, convenience stores, they do sell condoms, right? <laughs> But it's just funny because um, it's not funny. It's just uh, a lot of people might not know, but the number of reported HIV or AIDS cases in Beijing has continued to rise in recent years, reaching to 18,635 um by end of October, in fact, uh, the number of newly reported cases in the capital in the first 10 months of last year was 2,932, which is like 21% or more increase. Uh, it shows that uh, the government hasn't really taken that much precaution in terms of creating awareness or education, sexual, especially sexual education towards the students. In fact, that actually affected um, to not only the people or students, but also doctors. Uh, some doctors, they are having the lack of the sufficient knowledge about this particular disease, HIV transmission. So it is very important that the authorities and the government need to improve the publicity and education about HIV or AIDS. Mm. So from healthcare issue, <laughs> we move on to labor issue. Uh, I'm talking about ASEAN leaders. They are pushing for greater regional labor mobility. But I'm a bit curious here because when they say labor mobility, are they mentioning uh, like a certain labor, like skilled labor, or are they encompassing it all labors, which I doubt so. 
Oh, well, it looks like they're just uh, focusing on the labor in general for now. And then, uh, according to this, they said more engineers and architects in Southeast Asia. So, more skilled labor. Yeah, well, well for example, engineers and architects. And they have registered with the professionals' bodies in the region to have their qualifications recognized. And also, this uh, ASEAN Secretariat, there is a st uh, steady increase of these uh, registered professionals. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, you're right here that we're talking about the skilled laborers here who have started working in other ASEAN countries. But the positive thing is, uh, is it is expected to generate some 14 million additional jobs in 2025. But unfortunately, the jobs are for skilled laborers. So for, do, for those that are unskilled, unfortunately, they don't really fall into the AEC framework. And that's sad because uh, a lot of the problem uh, we have right now in terms of education, uh, employment and workforce, talent and skill, is it, it is the lack of uh, skilled labor and it is the fact that majority of uh, Southeast Asian are unskilled labor. So where are they going? And they are, unfortunately, they are mostly being exploited. There's no regulation or law to somehow protect them as workers. Well, that happens a lot in the countries like Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, or who have a lot of like unskilled uh, laborers there, especially in the retail businesses and also like service businesses where they're treated very unfairly. And then some of uh, them have um, their passport is just confiscated. So they cannot do anything but to stay in the country and just to earn money mm -hmm. with a very unfair treatment. So those unskilled laborers uh, need to be uh, addressed for AC, um, one of the plants as well. Maybe this is just the first step. They just focus on skilled labor because what they are doing right now, even for the skilled labor, there's no standardization. So ASEAN is also taking steps to create a qualification framework aimed at harmonizing regulatory arrangements between countries. So let's say uh, uh, there's a certain uh, minimum uh, standard if you want to work as an architect in Malaysia or Singapore. So the, the same minimum standard will be applied to all Southeast Asian countries and you would need that certificate to show that you are a qualified professional in architecture. So that's one of the first few steps that are Southeast Asia is taking but I hope that more will come soon uh, to create a more robust community where it encompasses the protection and the standardization of skill and unskilled labor. Well, it is also, like you say, it's a stepping forward to achieve the AEC. But at the same time, um, there should be a, uh, the equal, um, equal treatment to all the skilled labor to be able to, for them to be able to move around uh, with, uh, you know, easier access and uh, to be accepted in the country. So it is another the, a step to forward to protect all those lockers. Uh, local people in the one nation. For example, in Singapore, they also ha um, have been introduced to protecting uh, these lockers. Like in employers, they have uh, advertised all those vacancies on the government jobs uh, for at least 14 days before they can apply for the skilled foreign worker. So those are the the little uh, uh, the policies they have already made. And then also the Trade and Industry Ministry says that while Singapore welcomes the skilled manpower, it also cannot afford to have the unregulated flow of the foreign labor due to the country's is very small in physical size and limited resources. So when it comes to all this uh, dealing with the skilled laborers, the all the ASEAN countries also need to take consideration of the geographical issues and also how the, the wealthy the country is. So then with that, we can uh, be able to, you know, really achieve the, what we want to. In, in short, a lot of things to do <laughs> for ASEAN. <laughs> for sure. We'll take one short break. When we return, we will have more discussion about Southeast Asia. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. 
Hi, this is Arlene. Welcome back. This is Grace. And of course, you are with us on our ASEAN Daily. So, from China to the US to, of course, ASEAN, we st- we are still with ASEAN. Uh, just a bit of a news about ASEAN partnership. Apparently, according to uh, economists in ICS, uh, ICS, I, I guess uh-huh. that's how you pronounce it, uh, to them, uh, the key challenge uh, for ASEAN is to form strong partnership. And if we can, if a uh, strong partnership are being formed, that means we can overcome majority of the challenges within Southeast Asia. And in fact, uh, the former Indonesian president, uh, Dr. Susilo Bambang Yuho Yono, was conferred uh, a distinguished honorary fellowship at the Institute of the Southeast Asia on Friday. And then also, it, this was to recognition of uh, his leadership as president, his uh, contributions to the regional and the global leadership and also his role in the strengthening the ties between Indonesia and Singapore especially. Mm. And a lot of people might not know, but Susilo Banbang Yohoyono, he is um, he has been in power for two terms, uh, about 10 years, and he is being recognized as the president that somehow strengthened democracy in Indonesia. Of course, uh, with uh, Jokowi now... Uh, Democracy is proven that even though you are uh, a small time uh, furniture entrepreneur, you can still aspire to be a president in Indonesia. Quite a remarkable um, achievement for Indonesia. But for Yuho Yono, uh, what he is really uh, focusing uh, for when he was in uh, when he was a president of Indonesia, he he focused a lot on international relation, especially forming strong partnership with countries all over Southeast Asia as well as all over the will and that is his key strength I think and um, uh, Dr. Yonos, uh, one of the, the his focuses that, like you mentioned, uh, was to build up the international relationship outside of Indonesia. However, it, when it comes to the ASEAN, his focus was uh, mainly between the Singapore and Indonesia. That he actually mentioned it was good, strong, and uh, progressive. So, in fact, he highlighted these three areas that he wanted to be worked uh, by these two countries was to maintain the achievement made over the years in the terms of ties, finding more opportunities to strengthen trade and investment and tourism, and also managing challenges and issues well and the pro- properly in that uh, manner. And also he was pretty positive about the relationship between uh, these two countries. And he also said, if we can connect well, we can also cooperate better in the future. And he believes that it will bring good things to Singapore, Indonesia, and around the region as well. Mm. A lot of people might not know this, but of course his wish was a huge issue when he was still the president of Indonesia. But at the same time, he is quite concerned on the issue regarding on regional haze. In fact, Dr. Yuho Yono said that a green growth model is important in, in the formulation of the ASEAN economic community, especially in finding the balance between economic growth as well as maintaining the environmental, uh, the environment around this region. So, in a sense, uh, what we are seeing right now is, of course, uh, an Indonesia that is stronger. But I think what we need in the future is an ASEAN that is stronger. On another news, uh, the, uh, you mentioned earlier about Singapore. Uh, of course, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long also mentioned something about Southeast Asia or about ASEAN. ASEAN can be a platform for cooperation with China and the US. But we all know Singapore, just like Malaysia, has always been on a neutral side when it comes to balance uh, of power between the two big brother, which is China and the US. And then Malaysia is also no exception <laughs> when it comes <laughs> yes. to relationship. And a lot of people actually did uh, raise the question, why is Malaysia like you know, stuck between the US and China? Because and we need them both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then um, the question has still remained there. But however, when it comes to ASEAN, um, we just talked about the Singapore there. So speaking at the this uh, Singapore forum, which was just happened last week, which brought together 200 policymakers and also prominent thinkers, 
speakers and business leaders from around the region and also around the world. So, in fact, Mr. Lee he spoke of the the countries participating in the Asia Pacific Wide Framework, like APEC, and the talking about the security issues, like Asia Regional Forum. So he also talked about the issues that happened, and ultimately he wanted to make the UN an effective forum. So it seems like.、Uh, Singapore is definitely looking probably twenty years down the road because it can foresee that China is definitely surpassing、mm. the U.S. Just、uh, today, it was announced that、uh, the most spoken language in the world is no longer English. Guess what? It is, what language? It is Mandarin. <laughs> yes, actually, it, it, the Mandarin is the the number one language in the world still most be- spoken, and also because of the population. Yeah, but、um, so are you saying that more Chinese are making babies? Oh, that's for sure, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the, we, we, we reported before that China is、um, investing on the condom、uh, vending machines there <laughs> in the university. <laughs> Not related, <laughs> but somehow you make it relatable.、Yeah. <laughs> well,、um, we talked a little bit about the China's new Silk Road Economic Belt. It's one of the China's biggest ambitions they want to do, and in fact,、uh, Singapore it can. Probably、uh, take advantage of this China's new ambitious project,、uh, according to Mr. Li, and then these are the really、uh, positive proposals by China to cooperate with the countries in the region along Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia can also,、uh, furthermore, to Central Asia and also to Europe. So what it, we are seeing right now is definitely an ASEAN that is somehow a copycat version of Malaysia and Singapore's foreign policy, which is not being too、um, as biased either towards、uh, China or the US, but try to find a balance between both big brothers or giants. <laughs> <laughs> but another. Issue about ASEAN is also important, which is about financial integration. So the 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 headline was ASEAN to fail must try harder at financial integration. Apparently, we are not doing that well when it comes to integrating all the different finances.、Um, I I. I'm doubting so. I guess you're doubting so as well. <laughs> well,、yeah. we have a lot of issues when it comes to ASEAN, and then the handling the finance is one of the most important thing that we really need to look at. Because if not, the meeting of the ASEAN Central Bank governors, which is in Kuala Lumpur, has been told that while ASEAN has made a good initial progress towards achieving, but then more needs to be done. To be able to progress even further, so in fact, the president of Asian Development、uh, Bank,、uh, Takehiko Nakao, he said it at the meeting that ASEAN financial integration is a key pillar. In fact, and the, together with the free trade, investment, and also like we mentioned before, skill labor movement,、mm-hmm. he described the current external、uh, condition for ASEAN as generally favorable and forecasted regional growth. To exceed last year's、uh, average of 4.4 percent. In fact, countries like、uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam will continue to grow faster、uh, than the original ASEAN five, like and also Brunei Darussalam, of course. And、uh, and what he mentioned that is important is the foreign direct investment should increase as production continues to transfer into the country. Uh, into all these、uh, countries in the region, of course, but further financial integration can actually bring significant benefits to ASEAN. ASEAN high saving, which is at 32.5 percent of GDP in 2013, are not evenly distributed.、Uh, I guess more savings among countries in、uh, the The ASEAN Five, the original ASEAN Five, compared to the CLMV countries. So this is、uh, areas that we, we really need to focus on. In fact, financial integration is so important that it can it can definitely channel savings more. Efficiently to finance investments across ASEAN, and we all know right now、uh, to make ASEAN economic community possible is to focus on、uh, the building of infrastructure. A lot of investment are coming from outside. Uh, of this region, especially from China, and I think a lot of if we can focus more on intra-trade and internal investment, that will be more、uh, 
uh, I would say beneficial to Southeast Asia. And at the same time, it was also one of the issues that it can foreseen uh, to achieve uh, fi ASEAN financial integration was it can also bring risks to do the the greater cross border capital flows and also it can make countries the more vulnerable to financial crisis through the these regions just because of the because each country in southeast asia has a different uh, rates when it comes to capital and also the the flow so uh the closer coordination of these policies among ASEAN members may become very necessary mm -hmm. to be able to achieve the ASEAN financial integration. On the other hand, we have Timor Leste. <laughs> As we all know, Timor Leste is not part of Southeast Asia, it's not part of ASEAN, uh, but they are ready to join ASEAN. This is according to its ambassador to Malaysia. And um, he's, yes, he's ready, like you mentioned. And then he actually said after uh, the attaining the independence 13 years ago, he, he was pretty confident in fulfilling ASEAN membership criteria, including the providing sufficient human resources to attend numerous ASEAN meetings throughout the year. The ambassador to Malaysia, his name is Jose Antonio Amarum, <laughs> sorry, Amarim Diaz. Such a unique yeah, name, right? Very Portuguese sounding. Um, as we all know, the history of Timor Leste was a bloody one. Uh, in fact, uh, for so long, it was colonized, uh, not just by the Portuguese and Dutch, but also by Indonesia. And it, it took a long civil war for Timor Leste to finally gain independence in the early 2000s. But after attending uh, independence 13 years ago, Timor Leste was confident in fulfilling the ASEAN membership criteria, including providing sufficient human resources to attend numerous ASEAN meetings throughout the year. In fact, Timor Leste has at least fulfilled two major requirements for ASEAN membership so far. Namely, the country was located in this region and it had open embassies in ASEAN member countries, for example, in Malaysia. And also, he has opened the 22 embassies, like you mentioned. And or in fact, uh, let's go back to the few years ago, which was in the March 20, uh, 2011. Timor Leste has submitted the application to join ASEAN uh, during the Indonesian chairmanship of ASEAN. And currently, it is being reviewed by the special working group that wants to see the effort made by Timor Leste. So does it mean that he is the new member of the ASEAN or what is he actually going to do? How is his contribution going to be like I, towards the ASEAN? The, the thing is, we are not even clear about what his ASEAN uh, direction is. So having another one more member, I don't think it's, it will hurt ASEAN. In fact, I think it will add more benefits to ASEAN because Timor Leste has always been, uh, you know, um, part of Southeast Asia, so to exclude it will be a bit weird, isn't it? A bit odd. <laughs> and at the same time, like you mentioned, the benefits that it can include areas of trade, security, stability of the country, and also perhaps the culture exchange. I think the biggest stumbling block would be for Indonesia because relationship between Timor Leste and Indonesia uh, was never that good. Uh, due to the the long civil war, but I think after gaining independence for more than a decade, probably they can mend that relationship, and Indonesia can just you know move forward with a breakup and you know mend yeah. a broken heart. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this will definitely show the uh, perhaps the seriousness from the both sides, mm -hmm. from Timor Leste as well as the ASEAN member countries, because they are now putting the effort to establish the something called uh, the National Secret uh, Secretariat for ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So from Timor Leste, we move on to the South China Sea. So Philippines are gaining international support for South China Sea dispute. Well, of course, with China, um, I I think I would definitely lend my support to the Philippines. Uh, it's not because I'm against China, but I think for the South China Sea dispute, it is a complex matter, and I think countries, small countries like uh, the Philippines, should have a say on it. 
Well, um, last week we reported about the relationship between China and Vietnam. That they're really looking forward to, uh, you know, build a better relationship when it comes to South China Sea, uh, the matter. And now it has come to Philippines <laughs> <laughs> that um, they are uh, approaching the peaceful approach to deal with this maritime dispute with mm-hmm. China. That actually drew the support uh, from the international community, well, including the U.S. President Barack Obama, who reacted. Strongly on uh, the China's massive land uh, reclamation in the China, uh, South China Sea. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, of course, uh, the U.S. reaction towards China's land l- reclamation, following publication of pictures about uh, the land reclamation, it, we saw that the U.S. reaction is the strongest. In fact, it showed how Beijing was trying to create facts. In the water to strengthen its territorial claims in the South China Sea. In fact, what we are seeing right now is not just the U.S. reaction, but also surprisingly India's reaction. Right. Uh, India is also lending support to the Philippines. The same goes to Malaysia, and of course, we heard before how Indonesia's Jokowi uh, said that they. They are also lending support uh, on behalf of Indonesia, wanting to be the middle person to somehow um, ma- mediate uh, the the situation between uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, and of course with China. Mm-hmm. So, like you mentioned, the India and the Malaysia both. Well. That's why perhaps that's why it's called international support. That Malaysia, uh, the defense minister uh, Hashim Muhyiddin Hussein also said that Malaysia stood for the peaceful resolution for this uh, maritime dispute that also would promote peace and stability and mm-hmm. also security and trade and the freedom of navigation and also over flight in the South China Sea. Mm-hmm. So before we end the show, just to let you know, if you are in Thailand or uh, Myanmar. Uh, or even Cambodia, I guess. Um, there's this festival. It's called the Water Festival oh, or yes. Songkran. Uh, it's so much fun. You get to throw water among <laughs> towards each other. <laughs> yeah, it's a celebration, and then uh, it's one of the the Buddhist festival and the kingdom's most important public holiday there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lo- uh, of course, what we are mentioning right now is Thailand, a uh, hottest month where they throw water at each other and it's a religious festival in yep. fact, uh, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a religious festival in equally in the same in Myanmar and I think to some extent in other CLMB yeah, countries. And this, yeah, mm-hmm. and this festival attracts lots of foreigners from outside mm-hmm. and it has become very famous so a lot of foreigners do visit uh, Thailand for this festival particularly yeah so will you be joining I would love to <laughs> if I'm allowed to <laughs> <laughs> so with that uh, that's all from me today you can always follow us on Facebook Twitter and of course uh, Instagram to get the latest news from Southeast Asia and as well as we have our main channel so you can always visit our website drianazian.com and please leave us feedback it will be always welcome okay <laughs>